Together we are Family, Family Plot. Plot. Very nice, very nice. I, that day, that works. Wow. So, uh, welcome to the show. First and foremost, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I'll, also, if you want to help us out, uh, a few ways you can do that. There's Patreon, which is monthly donations. It's one, three, five, and ten, I believe. Uh, there's three different teams you can donate through. There's Team Podcast, Team Bunny, and Team Spa Day. Uh, which, by the way, yeah, you you are owed at least a spa day or two at this point, considering all the hard work you put in. Am I? Well, that's good to know. Thank you. <laughs> no, she like eight. It's like eight. eight also, spa days. <laughs> yeah. Also, uh, if you cannot do a monthly donation, that's okay. We've never been, you know, huge with our funds. Uh, do one is, but you can. Uh, help us out through buy me a coffee which is a one-time donation and if you can't do that well then just share the show on social media if you enjoy it if you don't enjoy it just keep, keep it, it to yourself. yourself there we go very nice like that also want to say thanks we are again on the good pods top 100 yay us yes uh barely in the case of uh history podcasts uh we were 96 there but oh, still dear. <laughs> still we're there, and it's our fans that put us there, so thank you very much. Uh, also, i got to warn you, there is a trigger warning on this episode. Uh, we will be talking about death and mental illness. Mm -hmm. If either of those are triggers for you, uh, feel free to you know skip this episode. Remember, you matter. We love you. You are part of the family. And we will see you in the next one. Yep. So, what are we talking about? Well, from 1864 to 1994, the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum, their name, not the one I gave it, uh, later renamed to the Weston State Hospital, treated thousands of patients. A hospital based on the Kirkbride plan, it could routinely hold 250 people. But in fairly short order, the number of occupants was soon over 10 times that number. We cover the history and the hauntings associated with the bastion of mental illness and bad medicine as we discuss the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. But first... But first, our Krista has facts. Krista, 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 Krista. Okay! So, welcome back to the Fat Corner, everyone. Um, welcome, welcome back to the Fat Corner, everyone. It's me, Krista, back with back with some weird facts. Um, yay, Krista! Yay, Krista! Yep, it's me. Okay. <laughs> um, today's facts are from thefactsite.com. We have been been here before. Thank you again, thefactsite.com. Today's today's facts are. From Sash Wig Wig You need help with the pronunciation? Yeah. Spell it. Sash is the first one I got, but wig it's like wig H ton. Wig Let me see. Wig H ton. Whiten is what it sounds like. Whiten. Shash Whiten. Yeah, yeah, Shash Whiten. I I I I appreciate difficult times or difficult names sometimes. 
because it helps me learn. There you go. Absolutely. Silver lining. I love it, Krista. Good job. Okay, so... So, what does Shash have to teach us about today? Well, let's see. Fact number one. Potatoes are actually from the, from South America. Oh, we're learning about potatoes? Potatoes. Yum. And you know what, come, what kind of potato comes from South America now? They might tell us in this... Do they talk about purple potatoes? I don't know if they do, but I enjoy me some purple potatoes. Purple potatoes are tasty. They are. It's been too long since I had a good purple potato. I don't think so. I don't think they will talk about that, but we can talk about that after I finish this fact about that. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Many people around the world would mistakenly identify Ireland as the as the source of this incredible incredibly versatile tuber. Tuber? Tuber. Yeah, that's the type of vegetable a potato is. Okay, that's weird. Okay. Um, while Ireland may have aided in the potato's rise to inter- international fame, that's where the country's involvement stops. The potato was actually domesticated from a wild plant in a region that includes the northwestern of Bo- Bolivia? Bolivia, yes. Bolivia and the south of Peru. The south of Peru, I see. It was completely unknown to the rest of the world until Spain's conquest of the Americas in the 16, 1600s. Wow. It was brought back to Europe by the Spanish cons, 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 conquistadors. Conquistadors. Conquistadors? Uh huh. Sometime around the late 16th century. 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 Please, please help me. I just said century. <laughs> late 16th century. Gosh. And was initially viewed. Init- You're doing fine, baby. Keep going. You're all right. You're all right. <laughs> Oh, initially viewed Uh with some hesitation. Good job. Well, yeah, I mean, for for people that like farming for them up to that point, with the possible exception of like carrots, was mostly stuff that grew above ground, like wheat, you know, grows above ground, right? you know, and stuff like that. Turnips, turnips are old, aren't they? Turnips are old, they they grow underground, so are carrots, Uh, but I'm saying most vegetables, so to introduce a new vegetable that grows underground... And it and it and it looks. I mean, you got to admit, the potato is brown on the outside, so it looks dirty anyway. Yeah, it looks pretty unappetizing if you just look at it. That's, right, that's right. Quite true. But when people decided they actually tasted good, they made it into a whole bunch of other things. And oh yes, I love potatoes. Oh, me too. Potatoes will kill me one day, but I love them. Uh, and there ain't no way you can prepare a potato unless you somehow put an egg on it, and then I'm. Um, you... Well, and and. There are there are there are things that have potatoes and eggs. So yeah, what quick way to ruin a potato is throw an egg on it. Yeah, you say quick so. way to ruin anything is to throw an egg on it. Look, Blah. you you are. Listen, I believe our listeners would have a very different well, opinion on that. All of them, because not everyone likes eggs, but. Not everyone dislikes eggs, so we're going to move on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, people can like or dislike what they want, I'm just saying. Me and eggs don't get along. Him and eggs don't get along, and apparently that's an opinion that he thinks he should have on here. Everyone has their opinions. Sometimes they're yes, just but wrong. I, I have a podcast <laughs> I'm allowed to share my opinions. <laughs> okay, well, I do too, and guess what? I am. So, let's move on to the next fact before I punch you in your nose. Oh, Crystalline. What? You threatened your daddy. Oh, no. On a live recording. Oh, no. That's not the first time Shame she has. Shame on you. Yeah. All right. So, 
those conquistadors freed the taters. Free the taters. Free the potatoes. I actually don't know if that sounds offensive at all, though. They... I'm going to apologize to our listeners, because if you can hear this, I don't know if I can... I'll be able to to squeeze it out by tomorrow. Uh, We have some idiots working in front of our house clearing trees, uh, and these guys couldn't run a target as a group. So, yeah... (laughs) Well, at least they're not dropping trees on our house this week. This week, like they were last week, that yeah. was fun. Yeah. So, really, I, I apologize. I will do my best. But if you hear this weird grinding sound, it's the tree trimmers. And dear God, if someone needs to have, teach them how to do their jobs. Okay, moving on. Your next fact, Krista. Okay, fact number two. People have been growing potatoes for at least seven thousand years. Seven seven thousand. That's that's a while. That's that's a little that's a little while. Yeah. You know. That's a minute. That's for sure. People have had potatoes for a second. As mentioned, it's a little while. Yeah. <laughs> As mentioned, the potato was domesticated in parts of Bolivia and Peru. While we know this happened somewhere between 8,000 and 5,000 BC, the first archaeological evidence comes from much later. This evidence comes from Ancon? Comes from where? Ancon? A N C O N. Anson? Ancon? I'm not sure. I'm sorry if I butchered that. I really did not mean to. You're good. Keep going. You're fine. Hold on, I need to find out where it was. Ancon, one of the major pre Hispanic archaeological sites in Peru that date back to 25,000 BC. Wow. See, when you say domesticate. Or not 25,000, 2,500. Right. Right. When you say domesticate potatoes, I, I picture this like giant potato with like teeth like snarling and then, you know, with a whip like, down! Back! Jump through the fiery hoop, you know. It. <laughs> That's a little messed up. When I think of domesticated potato, I think of like a, a cute drawing of a, of a potato just letting somebody pet it. See, I, I just, I, in my head, I just see this wild potato. Rah, rah, back potato, back, rah, rah, down, rah. Good potato. <laughs> Good potato. Stop, yeah. please. <laughs> this is worse than Mr. Mouse. No, I kind of like the rabid potato. Hate the rabid potato. I am amused. Huh, I could come back. Please leave. Don't. <laughs> Poor tight hours. Okay. Hidden away among countless other incredibly important archaeological artifacts were the remains of a potato tuber from some from some 4,500 4, years ago. Wow. That was a I bet wow. that had so many sprouts coming out of it. It's uh, not even funny. Yeah, probably. It probably was like a vine of multiple potatoes, right? It was it was the it was the great 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 grandpappy of all the purple potatoes. This is the family tree, but it's for family potato wine. This is the family roots, literally. They said we're looking for fossils, not fossilated freaking potatoes. Well, we know we know how big a fan of Josh Gates I am. Oh man, crush! I have and and recent well. On an episode of uh, Expedition Unknown, uh, he was in Peru uh, looking for lost gold or something. Anyway, he came across a lake where the legend is is that they, like a priest would sail out just covered in gold and, and they would sink like gold items in this pool. And... and and 
and uh, the thing is, is that one of the things they have found in that pool is lots of these little potatoes because they would throw them in as sacrifices for the gods. Mm. Baby water potatoes, yummy. Better than a water chestnut. Never had chestnut. I like water chestnuts. I like them in my chow mein. Other than that, no. I like water chestnuts. Well, Chris, I am learning so much about potatoes. What else do you got for me? Well, there are around 4,000 different types of potatoes. Really? I've only had like five. If you include non-commercial varieties, that is. Varieties. Yes. Well, maybe I've had more than five. I've had sweet potatoes. I've had russet potatoes. I've had bread potatoes. I've had gold potatoes. I've had yellow potatoes. And purple potatoes. I've had at least six types of potatoes, so... But no, how many did you say? 3,000? 5,000. 5,000? 4,000. 4,000? Okay, right. That's a lot of kinds of potatoes. Yes. This includes a wide variety of potatoes grown in South South America, which are much like those brought back to Europe in the 1600s. Or 1600s, sorry. Keep saying that. (laughs) That's okay, baby. Maybe it was a really long time ago. No. Maybe they they rode to, to the New World in boats made of potato. Sir! <laughs> Jeez. The rest of the list... Potato comprise- boats are actually... Mom! Home, but usually they have sour cream and eyes and cheese. Oi! <laughs> no potato boats right now! I'm, bus- I'm speaking! Respectful! But we have all the stuff. Sorry, go ahead. Thank you. Mm-hmm. You these guys are trying to take my spotlight. But now I want potato boats. <laughs> no potato boats. But they be so tasty. No. Uh, okay. I think we're about to give our Krista fits. About to? blame the noise. Anyway, facts. Sorry, Crystal, and go ahead. You're okay. The well, rest of now the- I'm hungry, but we're, we're gonna keep going. The rest of the list comprises of, comprises all the different potato co- cultivators that have been developed in the 400 years or so since. While there are thousands of different potatoes, generally only a handful will be available within a region. In the UK, for example, there are only 80 or so different potatoes that are more commonly found on a larger commercial scale. Um. Also, I don't know if sweet potatoes count as actual potatoes. Why not? Well, they're definitely tubers like potatoes, but... I would think that they would. Maybe. I don't know. I'm just saying. I do not know. Okay. Because... Uh, I gotta look that up. Keep going. Keep going. Because they, you know, they talk about, like, yams. And I know yams are sweet potatoes. Right. But it may be its own thing. Hmm. It may be tangentially related without being an actual member of the potato family. Speaking of related of, to potatoes... Potatoes belong to the same family as tobacco. All right. Give me some tobacco. No. Most people would be surprised to hear that potatoes belong in the same family as tobacco and deadly nightshade. It turns out the... I don't know how to say this. S-O-L-A-N... C-E-A-E. Solanacea? Snowy. Snow. Solanacea. Solanacea? Yeah, Solanacea. Solanacea family. It is very, very broad and includes many plants which we wouldn't think to be related. Ow. 
This list includes edible varieties of plants such as potatoes, tomatoes, and eggplants. It also includes smokable varieties such as tobacco and quite a few and a few quite toxic varieties like deadly nightshade. All right. And then you had Homer Simpson who combined tobacco with the tomato and created tomacco. And if you play any of the Simpsons games, you will see signs that say eat tomacco. I see. Interesting. So just just so we're clear um, bases on this. So apparently sweet potatoes and potatoes are root vegetables that are only very distantly related to one another. Yeah, I, that's what I said. I, I couldn't find a specific answer as to whether or not sweet potatoes are considered a type of potato. I mean, they call them potatoes, so... Yes, but scientifically, they may not be. So... Until a scientist comes out and tells me, no, a sweet potato is not a potato, I am not going to believe anything they say. Fair enough. It's the internet. The internet isn't always right. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> are you... Are, are, do you got more facts? I got one more fact. Okay. Fact away. Fact number... Sorry. Fact number five. You shouldn't eat a potato that's gone green. The green bits themselves aren't necessarily bad for you. Though, when a potato has gone green, it simple, simply means it's been too exposed to, too, to a bit too much sun during storage. The spud then converts that sunlight into chlorophyll. That's a chemical that makes plants green. If a potato has developed a, green, a few green spots, it's also a sign that it's begun to try and protect itself from hungry animals by producing a neurotoxin toxin called sol solanine? Solanine, yeah. This doesn't mean you should necessarily throw out a potato that's developed a green spot or two, though so small spots can be peeled or cut away. But you should probably just throw the potato out if there's any more than that. To give you an idea, if an adult were to eat just one green potato, that would, they would become nauseous and develop headaches, with the possibility of it developing into something much more severe. Wow. Is that it? Yeah. This is my fifth fact. Wow. I learned a lot about potatoes today. I didn't expect to. So much potato. So, let's settle in to talk about the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. Now, th this place has a bit of a history, and some of it is pretty cool. Well, I mean, we're talking about almost 100 years. Or yeah. over 100 years. Yeah. Over yeah. 100 years. Yep. Yeah. It begins in 1851. The Virginia Assembly voted for the funds to create a modern mental hospital. Uh, they consulted Thomas Kirkbride, then superintendent of the Pennsylvania Institute for the Insane. So apparently in the 1850s, naming these places was a lot easier. <laughs> I guess. And it was decided to build the new edifice based on the Kirkbride plan. Now, the Kirkbride plan was a novel idea that the architecture of mental institutions could be improved to improve patient care. Mm. They hired architect Richard Thomas Snowden, uh, who built the hospital in Gothic Revival and Tudor Revival do, style. Why do I, uh, 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 
Thomas Snowden. Have we talked about him before? That name seems very familiar. No, but he is a pretty famous architect. He actually de- designed a national building. Oh, okay. So, yeah, he's, he's fairly okay. famous. The name just seemed familiar. I apologize. Go ahead. Oh, it's okay. Now, initially it was built using mostly prison labor. Those stonemasons were brought in from Scotland in Germany because apparently having them communicate to each other wasn't important. I imagine two a Scottish and a German stonemason just arguing, and they're saying the same things, but they don't understand each other because of their accents. <laughs> but that seems like it could be an issue for sure. In 1861, the Civil War broke out, and Virginia seceded from the Union. Boo, Virginia. The governor of Virginia demanded the remaining funds from the hospital to put towards their own defense. Unbeknownst to them, the 7th Ohio Volunteer Infantry had already arrived at a Virginia bank, demanded the unused funds for the asylum, and took it to Wheeling, which is in today in West Virginia. There, the money was used to create the reorganized government of Virginia, which went on to become West Virginia and a staunch ally of the Union. The reorganized government of Virginia voted to appropriate the funds to finish the hospital, which was then renamed the West Virginia Hospital for the Insane. Uh, West Virginia was admitted as a state in 1863, and the hospital was completed in 1864. Though con- construction continued on some parts of the hospital, uh, the massive clock tower was completed in 1871, and rooms for black patients, because you couldn't have black insane people in the same rooms as white insane people because stupid. Yeah, that's exactly what it was because stupid indeed. We're finished in 1873. The hospital was meant to be self-sufficient, so a farm, a dairy, waterworks, and a cemetery were added to the property, which reached 666 acres. I would have built something else, a ski ball, something, yeah. anything to 667, 665. An extra outhouse, something. Yeah, I, I definitely would have built something. So. I agree with you, Ben. <laughs> uh, now, at this point, people could be admitted to psychiatric institutions for many reasons. These reasons could include laziness, greediness, <laughs> Menstrual derangement, which basically means Sign that, me up. which basically means that if your period was too heavy and it and it made you too emotional, they could put you in a mental institution. Yep. Sign me up. Overreading of novels. Domestic unrest, arguing with spouse. So if you're a woman arguing with your husband, he can drop you off in a mental and political opinions. Like Krista, remember when we started and how much you didn't like Trump? You could be put in back in jail for or in a mental institution for that back in the 1870s. I don't talk too much about political stuff because I'm 13 and don't know much about it. But I know a little bit, and with the stuff that I do know, um, I, I'm still I, I'm still not going to say it out loud because I don't want to have any differences between my fans and the people, you know, that I care about. So, good girl. So, that's a rough, rough list, and there were many other equally silly reasons to warehouse people, which is really what they were doing. They were warehousing people that were problems, some of them with actual mental pro- issues, some of them not having mental issues, and they just put them together. And as you can imagine, this didn't, didn't go, go well. real well. Yeah. Uh, now, that being the case, the hospital was quickly overfilled, causing a shortage of care, bed, and just about everything else. So let's take a moment for a word from our sponsors, and then we'll come back and talk a little more about the history of the asylum itself. Hey, honey. Oh, hey, guess what? What? I feel sponsored. Awesome. (laughs) So... Going back to the hospital. Now it's the 1900s. They decide, well, let, let's provide our own power. So they drilled a well for gas on the site in 1902. 
In 1913, it was renamed once again to the Weston State Hospital. Uh, originally designed to house 250 patients in solitude, the hospital held 17, 717 patients by 1880, 1,661 in 1938, over 1,800 in 1949, and at its peak, 2,600 in the 1950s in very overcrowded conditions. Wow. A 1938 report by a survey committee organized by a group of North American medical organizations found that the hospital housed epileptics, alcoholics, drug addicts, and non-educable mental defectives among its population. Wow. A series of reports by the Charleston Gazette in 1949 found poor sanitation, insufficient furniture, insufficient lighting, insufficient heating in much of the complex, while one wing which had been rebuilt using Works Progress Administration funds following a 1935 fire started by a patient, was comparatively luxurious. Uh, lack of proper care and hygiene led to numerous deaths, and while there is no official number, historians place the number somewhere between four and 500 patient deaths. Dang! You know, that had to be some pretty insufficient... I mean, that's got to be... Oh... Can you imagine how badly you have to be treated to have poor enough hygiene that it kills you? No, I can't because, like, I you have... Think about how many days your brother has gone without bathing. And is perfectly fine with it. How bad does your hygiene have to be to actually kill you? That's probably like a couple that's of years. So honestly. terrible. Well, and you got to remember too that right up until about the 1950s, I mean, psychiatry has not been. That is true. They used to do physical things. I mean, you also have to remember to supposedly treat mental illness like. Not even just like lobotomies and, and electric shock treatment, but like in the in the old days they used to use like naughty things. To, to you treat have psychological stuff too. It was weird. Yeah, you, yeah, you, definitely. You have to remember that if you don't, if you go without showers for a really long time, and then you just take a shower one day, that you can die sometime after you've taken that shower. Shower because your body was used to the conditions that was that it was previously in. Maybe. Well. Uh, and you also have to understand, too, that the history of psychology and psychiatry is rife with bad ideas. Yes, I mean, right. that's, that's what I was trying to say, but I was uh, trying to keep it, you know, there, there was a, friendly. a thought that if your mind wasn't working properly, they could correct it by correcting your body. So they might lop off a couple of fingers in the hopes that gets your mind working right. Right. Which, of course, it didn't. That's uh, just the medical field overall, though, because they, like, bled people. And yeah, just... Psychiatry and psychology have been... Uh, in my mind, ha have have committed much worse sins because I mean, think about it. It was only the 1970s when homosexuality was removed as a mental illness. I mean, yeah, but like people are going back to that sort of like. It's well, like, I don't think they're they're not going back to, to it now. Be. But I I think there are people who still wish that that was the case, and shame on them. Yeah. Yeah, and people nowadays are still trying to get rid of those people. And then like, at, in the 1950s, physician Walter Freeman was on staff, and he began to carry out transorbital lobotomies, mm. where essentially 
the doctor would slide a pick next to the eye, just above the nose. With a tap with a mallet, the doctor would, would drive the, the pick into the thin bone of the eye socket and into the brain. Yeah, no. And with a quick turn, would sever the connections between the frontal lobe and the rest of the brain. These procedures were very common, and those who suffered them had varied results. Uh, yeah, the most common thing is a, a lowering of practical intelligence after you after you had this, because they didn't understand the brain, and they're basically driving an ice pick in it through the eye. Mm -hmm. Everything from death to personality change to a lowering of functional intelligence. Now, by the 1980s, much of the patients were living off-site. Those who couldn't be managed with medication or other treatments were locked in cages. And this is the 1980s. Wow. Eventually, the hospital was closed in 1994 before it was purchased by its new owner, who has reverted it back to its original name, the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum, and has opened it up for historical and paranormal tours. And that is the history of the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. Wow. So let's talk about some of its inhabitants, some of the ones who haven't left. Well, you know, uh, maybe... My maybe question is, why, did, why would they want to stay? Well, maybe they couldn't leave, though. That's I have, fair. I, I have a theory about some of that. Okay. Uh, there's a ghost they call Lily. She's one of the best-known ghosts on site. Most think she's the spirit of a child that was born and died on the site. Aww, poor little Lily. Commonly reported paranormal activity by Lily includes the holding of hands, tugging of clothing, giggles, stealing of candy, candy, and invisible games of ball. Like you can hear someone playing with a ball, but you can't find them. I'm going to take her all the candy. I want to go and take Lily candy. I'm so sad for her. Well, if you do, uh, she tends to be on the first floor near her room. So there you okay. go. Uh, another uh, person that's there, Ruth. At one time, an older woman who lived on the first floor who had a severe dislike of men, uh, almost violent at times. Uh, she continues to this dislike in death, often being heard to chastise men, throwing things at them, or tugging violently at their clothes. Well, you know... Uh, next up, we have a ghost named Dean. Now, despite having an awesome name, <laughs> Dean wasn't a nice person. Oh. Uh, he often tells visitors to get out from his second floor cell. It is believed he is one of two people who committed suicide together. Well, I what? mean... There's a, the spirit of a stabbing victim on the second floor, and he's been known to tug on the pants of visitors as if still seeking help for his injury, even long after his death. Poor the, guy. Then there's Elizabeth, the full-body apparition of a nurse, still seen doing her rounds on the second floor, also known to open doors, especially doors that should be closed. You go, Elizabeth. She's still trying to get her shit done. And then there's the Creeper. Now, the Creeper is mostly who had been seen on a show called Paranormal Lockdown, which was on Destination America. This angry spirit is responsible for voices, EVPs, appearing as a shadow man, shadow creatures, and full-bodied apparitions. It may be a spirit that's never been a person, like an elemental or a demonic entity. That's what a lot of people believe. There are also ghosts of boys in the downstairs bathrooms and several other ghosts on site. So, yay. Lots of creepy stuff there. <laughs> now, let's talk about the creeper, because I have a theory on that. I wonder... Because basically this place was used to warehouse people that didn't fit into society. They didn't have the drugs to treat them, so they basically mm -hmm. just locked them away, right? Sure. I wonder if you, you get enough people with mental illness together, mm -hmm. if maybe the mentally ill parts of their brain sort of cling to one another after death, like that part of their spirit. And so what you wind up with is like this mass of energy that is literally crazy energy. Mm -hmm. And that what? it's not demonic, but it's hewing together with all these other 
crazy intelligences because it's the only comfort it has. And it's lashing out like someone with a mental illness would. And, and that's just a thought. I, I can't <laughs> prove any of that, but it, it makes that's sense. an interesting thought, though. I would have never put it in that perspective, but I like it. What about you, Krista? I mean... People don't always necessarily want to be in the place they died in their afterlife. And I don't think it's a great place to be in either. Like, a subside in, or a, what was it? Like, just be in because that... It wasn't a great time, and it's not a great place to be, is basically what I'm saying. And, like, uh-huh. you can't really change it. Sure. So it's kind of... It, their experiences in past is something that nobody will know, and it's, like... You can't really say much about it. It's... Well, this... Uh, the, the, the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum has been featured much in popular culture. Uh, it was host featured on the show Ghost Stories. Obviously, it was on Ghost Hunters as well. Ghost Adventures with Zach Bagans as his crew. Uh, the show Paranormal Lockdown on uh, Destination America is on that. Portals to Hell with uh, Jack Osborne. Uh, Destination Fear is on that show. And Conjuring Kesha. Or Keisha. Might be Keisha. I don't know. Also, it's the basis for Fort Defiance in Fallout 76. Now, I don't have anything against Fallout, but Fallout 76 is like my least favorite because it takes base building, which was the worst thing about the Fallout games, and makes it like the biggest spotlight of the game. So I'm mm. not a big fan. But it is cool to know that they use the place as a, as a model for that, that area. Uh, and that's really it. If you ask me to sort of wrap up my thoughts, I'm going to say, well, just like a prison or an asylum is going to be a place that's going to be haunted because, especially when it was overcrowded like this place was, yeah, because almost certainly bad things happened here. Sure. And... You know that when that when enough happens, and when you're dealing with people who are have mental issues, I don't know how much that dissipates in death. I don't know how much that like maybe it clings on because you always hear about you know old Joe is crazy and now that's why he's a ghost. So mm-hmm. I, I don't know if there's any truth to that, but it's my thought. That's an interesting thought. I don't. I just think that that amount of suffering, going back to the people who just died from just being not cared for, that amount of suffering has to leave its mark on places. And I think that's where we end up with a lot of these hauntings. It's just... Suffering, human suffering and despair is such. It's like it's like spoiled food. Yeah. It's like you get into it an area with. Uh, yeah. It leaves a smell. Yeah. Yeah. And, exactly. And, it leaves a mark. It does. And, and that you're right. That sort of suffering seems to leave a psychic mark and one yeah. that that it, uh, almost reactive, yeah. like uh, in and of itself. Yeah, you think about if if you leave if you leave wet clothing. Yeah. Just to lay on a floor, it will the clothing itself will mildew and it will ruin, but if you continue to leave it there, that mildew and that ruin can spread to what's underneath it. And without replacing everything underneath it, there's always going to be that mark there. And even if you do replace everything underneath it, there may still be some kind of smell left there. or So I, I think that that's sometimes things are just bad enough that they leave that mark that's really hard to make go away. And I feel like 
that kind of suffering can leave those marks and and that's just kind of where it is. Krista, do you have any final thoughts to, to share? I mean, I've shared most of what I thought, just done. Don't tickle the crystal. She's not in the mood, Daddy. Okay. <laughs> it's something, like, I feel like I've already said my thought, thoughts on this. It's something that you can't really change. It's something that they've had experiences with and something that they're just attached to in their afterlife. And I feel for those people because they didn't really do anything wrong. Other than played, you know, Fallout 76. Just because well, you have man. different opinions doesn't mean you need to force it on other people, Dad. Ha, so. uh, does that bring us to the end? That pretty much brings us to the end of our time. Uh, thanks to all of our listeners. Uh, please keep listening. I like hitting... Uh, e- I-, I like being in that top... In the Good Pods Top 100. I-, I wouldn't mind being on other Top 100s, you know. Um, yeah, share us. So, uh, thanks to the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum, their website is where I got a significant amount of this information. So, thank you all for maintaining a good website and keeping especially the historical information up where it can be found. Because that, to me, was one of the things is like... I, this the, like this place almost didn't exist because if the money had been taken by Virginia as it seceded, I very seriously doubt they would have tried to finish the 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 asylum. Probably not. Yeah. You know, so it, it, just the fact that there was a that kind of gold switch is kind of a, a cool point of history. Um, so yeah, again, thanks to Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. Uh, your website is amazing. Thanks to Bill Barrent, who does our theme music. If you need music for a project, Bill's your guy. You can reach him at Bill Barrent, and that last name is spelled B-E-H-R-E-N-D-T at sbcglobal.net. Thanks to uh, our own Krista and Paige Elmore of Reverie True Crime for logo art. Thank you, Paige. Thank you, Paige. Thanks to Aaron Gunnerk of the Big Dumb Fun Show, who continues to promote us locally. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, join us next week as we go full historical and full medical issue with the Radium Girls. Mm-hmm. Yep. That one will not be short or fun in any way. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much. Uh-huh. Bye. 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 Bye.